Okay, now you can begin. Okay, let me share the slides. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Majib Shah, let me make you a uh, co-host and uh, Dr. Fozia, you can introduce our Papana before that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. start again. Uh, you should start again. Okay, let me... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, recording, I will cut out the... Uh, yeah, yeah. now oh. start again, okay? Okay, yeah, start. It is on record. You can start. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I welcome all of you today from Papana, Pakistani American Psychiatric Association of North America. Uh, Papana has brought you a series of lectures and a study group on a psychopharmacology. Uh, this is our um, fourth lecture um, uh, on the psychopharmacology lecture series. Uh, this is conducted by um, Education Committee of Papana in collaboration with Camp Psych, King Edward Medical University Psychiatry Interest Group. Uh, today, the topic uh, of this lecture is on antidepressants before uh, we have given on general pharmacology. And uh, today, uh, we are giving an introduction, introductory dis discussion on antidepressants. And uh, we would, uh, Dr. Shah will be describing uh, how um, antidepressants work on receptors and uh, how by learning this, uh, recept uh, this neuromodulation and on receptor level, how we can modify action of uh, antidepressants. Uh, Dr. Mujib Shah is an adjunct professor of psychiatry and residency director at the Toro University of Nevada and the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, he will take you step by step through this process. Uh, Dr. Shad is the recipient of the Best Teacher Award of, uh, of the Year by the uh, PGR3 residents at the Samaritan Psychiatry Residency. And uh, we are pretty confident that you won't want to miss this opportunity of learning from him, uh, just like it. he's an excellent teacher. We have got a very good feedback on our previous lectures and we, uh, we, um, we are confident that you will enjoy this lecture also. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Yeah, thank you, Fazia, for, for a very kind introduction. Yeah, let me share the slide so we can start this. Yeah, I made you co-host, Dr. Shah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And while they are sharing their slides uh, to all the participants, I am welcoming you. You guys can join Papana at papana.org. Uh, and membership for the residents, medical students, doctors from Pakistan is absolutely free. Um, uh, membership for US resident fellows, medical student is absolutely free. So you can get updates on, on our educational activities. Thank you. Okay. Can you see the slides? Not yet? Yes, yes. we can see the slides. Yes, we can okay. see the slides. Okay. So let me go to the presentation mode. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, Asrama Rikum, everyone. Um, so, we are going to talk about uh, uh, the antidepressants today. Um, and uh, uh, you know, my title of the presentation is pretty uh, kind of uh, provo uh, provocatory because uh, because it's kind of a question rather than than expression uh, that can we understand uh, mechanism based learning? Uh, 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 can mechanism based learning optimize antidepressant response and tolerability? So so. One of the things which I wanted to do through this this uh, this introductory lecture on antidepressant is to give you an idea that um, that if we understand the mechanisms of these medications better, I think uh, we can use these uh, medications uh, uh, much more effectively uh, with better tolerability and 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 uh, better response rates. And I'll I'll try to. Uh, present uh, when I'm presenting my slides, I'll I'll try to raise this this point throughout my presentation so that so that you can have some some uh, some examples of what I'm trying to say. So let's begin. Uh, 
<clears throat> so basically, I think uh, this is this is just I will take just uh, a few uh, a minute or two that actually the story of development of antidepressant uh, uh, treatments um, is is not not so new because you can see that. Uh, in um, in thirties, we actually um, started using uh, elect electroconvulsive uh, therapy, uh, which uh, initially uh, was very gruesome because they were not using uh, anesthesia, uh, uh, you know, to to control the motor uh, activities uh, induced by the shock, and so the patients uh, uh, really uh, uh, actually patients used to double, uh, to have fractures and because of the violent movements so i think it got a lot of bad name uh, one of the historical uh, fact which we most of us know is that you know that movie one flew over cuckoo's nest which was actually uh, 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 picturized in 1975 although the incident happened much earlier uh, and then, um, uh, you know, ECT got a really bad name. And till this day, ECT is considered uh, uh, a very uh, a gruesome procedure, despite the fact that, you know, the recent uh, uh, research uh, data have shown that it can be safer than the medications. Um, and, and it is done very safely under uh, general anesthesia. Anyway, so let's moving on. Um, uh, the first uh, effective antidepressant medications, although we know that there have been uh, some um, uh, non-conventional uh, way of treating depression in the past, uh, which is a whole different story. So we are not going to go there, but, but the first effective antidepressant, uh, which was uh, approved was actually two classes of antidepressants. Uh, one is uh, known as tricyclic antidepressant, the other one is known as uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So, um, so I think the the, the first um, ever uh, antidepressant which was uh, which was approved in 1958 was actually uh, uh, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Although some book uh, some uh, uh, some reviews actually say it was imipramine, but there was a very very narrow difference between the two. So ipronyazid uh, was the first monoamine oxidase inhibitor was found by chance or by serendipity because uh, uh, they were uh, trying to treat uh, tuberculosis with ipronyazid and they found that the patients who were getting ipronyazid instead of having better response in terms of anti-tuberculous uh, uh, anti effects, they actually starting having more social interactions and talking to each other and became more socially active and interactive. So they figured out that there may be something uh, about this uh, molecule, which is uh, uh, increasing the, uh, the social activities and the energy level of these patients. So they looked into it and they, and, and they actually did uh, very small sample studies uh, in those times, and they got it approved by the FDA. Unfortunately, ipronyazid was soon uh, taken uh, away from the market because it caused uh, severe cases of hepatitis. And so, uh, and, and, but, but later on they found safer molecules, uh, which had more amino oxidase inhibition activity, just like Ipronia acid, but, but didn't cause any hepatitis. Uh, so for example, isocarb oxazid uh, was approved and then uh, phenylzine and then tranyl cypromine uh, and selegiline is one of the latest ones. Uh, which is a very in uh, interesting story by itself. We'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, so tricyclic antidepressant, the first one was imipramine. It was also discovered uh, by chance because uh, the researchers were trying to develop a better antipsychotic medication, uh, thinking that chlorpromazine, which is also a tricyclic antidepressant, was the first effective antipsychotic medication they thought maybe imipramine will also be will also be effective in that sense, uh, but but it turned out to be a antidepressant. Any case, so it took about uh, uh, from uh, 1958 to about uh, you know 19 uh, uh, mid 80s. Actually, Prozac was the first one which was approved in 1988, I think. Uh, so it took se se actually decades before we moved on from monoamine oxidase inhibitors to uh, and tricyclic antidepressants to SSRIs. 
and then of course there is a there is a much quicker uh, uh, kind of development of different classes of antidepressants after after that so let's move on um, so i think these a uh, couple of slides are going to take a lot of time uh, and maybe we'll spend all the time on these these couple of uh, slides because uh, i just wanted to introduce you to the mechanism based classification of antidepressants which is the basis of of our learning today so as you can see uh, the first one on the top at the top is monoamine oxidase inhibitors i already already told you the story about it um, but uh, what about the mechanism so the mechanism uh, is is very easy to understand uh, monoamine oxidase is an enzyme which metabolizes uh, the uh, catecholamines uh, and and indolamines um, uh, which means that i'm talking about uh, about uh, norepinephrine uh, and dopamine and the indolamine is the serotonin uh, neurotransmitter so they actually uh, uh, kind of very effectively efficiently destroy these these monoamines uh, and 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 so one of the, the you know when we began to learn that depression uh, may be mediated by uh, some deficient activity of uh, monoamines uh, we thought maybe if we inhibit this enzyme actually it was a, a, dis a discovery by chance so we actually found these things later on because we we cannot take credit of finding the first effective antidepressants uh, for that matter even the antipsychotics so these were by chance discoveries but just just giving making a point that by inhibiting the metabolism of those important monoamines uh, their uh, transmission uh, neurotransmission improved and that uh, uh, putatively we, we think mediates the antidepressant response of monoamine oxidase inhibitors as you can see that monoamine oxidase inhibitors actually uh, uh, are uh, involved the, the the three major neurotransmitter systems naming noradrenergic uh, uh, serotonergic uh, and dopaminergic systems uh, it is it is very easy to understand that monoamine oxidase inhibitors are one of the most effective antidepressants ever developed uh, because they i i actually call monoamine monoamine oxidase inhibitors at broad spectrum antidepressants uh, unfortunately uh, they never became popular, popular and 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 most of you would know the reason behind it uh, was the hypertensive crisis which occurs with the high tyramine containing foods in which uh, uh, you know the um, the tyramine uh, is absorbed in huge amounts because you are blocking monoamine oxidase a and that huge amount of tyramine actually goes and displaces norepinephrine from the binding sites and that causes a, a hypertensive storm because there's so much norepinephrine available in the system suddenly which causes extreme vasoconstriction of the arteries and arterioles and and that results in hypertensive crisis so uh, uh, so uh, the most important foods to remember uh, uh, with high tyramine uh, tyramine content uh, are the the the, uh, the the beer and the old uh, or the age uh, aged cheese uh, and and some of the beans and the monosodium glutamate the the, the salt so there are uh, you know there's a whole list of them uh, you can read about them so that is one of the major reason why monoamine oxidase inhibitors despite uh, their uh, the broad spectrum antidepressant activity never became uh, popular uh, i so i think before i move on i just wanted to uh, to give you uh, uh, i i just noticed uh, selegiline is misspelled uh, but selegiline story is very interesting because um, there is a uh, there is a pharmaceutical company uh, which i think it was uh, bristol myers squibb which actually uh, looked at selegiline um, um, as an antidepressant uh, for the first first time. Uh, we all know that selegiline is used in the treatment of Parkinson's disease because selegiline is a selective monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. And we know that monoamine oxidase B inhibitor uh, is primarily metabolizing dopamine. And so you want to increase dopaminergic activity in Parkinson's, which makes perfect sense. Although um, you know later uh, we 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 already knew 
that if we give uh, more than the lowest, uh, the, the approved dosages by the FD of selagiline, which is uh, five milligram, uh, you know, you can actually uh, uh, become non-selective and you can uh, start inhibiting monoamine oxidase A as well which actually can increase the risk for hypertensive crisis, I, I, as I was just talking about, because monoamine oxidase A in, uh, metabolizes tyramine in the gut and prevents uh, from extensive absorption from the gut, which I told you the story uh, is the reason why hypertensive crisis occurs, right? So selagiline, um, uh, you know, the, this this is this is how innovative psychopharmacology comes into picture. That uh, the the pharmaceutical company actually developed a patch for selagiline, uh, and that is such a smart idea because if you bypass the GI tract uh, and you bypass the inhibition of uh, tyramine metabolism in the GI tract, you can avoid food drug interaction. Uh, because uh, uh, most of the drug from the skin goes uh, to uh, uh, to the uh, 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 goes into the brain uh, without going through the liver, right? So, so, uh, so first pass effect is gone. So that is why selenium patch, which was approved in in, in uh, uh, 2000, I think, early 2000, uh, is available, but it is so expensive that very few pe few people can use it. But I participated in the clinical trials of selagilin patch, which is known as MSAM, uh, E-M-S-A-M is the trade name for that. Um, but I participated in the clinical trials for, for MSAM and we found, uh, you know, it was difficult to maintain the blind because patients were responding so robustly so that we knew who is on the medication and who is on the placebo. Anyway, so uh, coming back, you know, these are all little details which, you know, are, are very uh, interesting to know. Um, so that is the story be behind monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Um, but uh, I don't want to uh, forget to tell you that since they work on three systems, uh, there are uh, some adverse effects as well. So the tolerability is not as desirable as you would imagine, uh, because we know that even the medications which work on uh, one neurotransmitter system only can cause side effects. And this, these are the three systems which actually can cause uh, some problems. So the next uh, uh, anti class of antidepressant, which was, uh, which was discovered as we were just talking, uh, is the non-selective, uh, is known as non-selective norepinephrine and serotonin reuptake inhibitor. They are also called tertiary, I mean, tricyclic antidepressants. So just let me clarify here, uh, tricyclic antidepressants are of two types. One is called the tertiary, I mean, tricyclic, and the other one is called the, uh, the, the secondary, I mean, tricyclic antidepressant. And there is some major differences between the two. It is very important to remember. So I'll tell you about that when we move to the, uh, to the uh, secondary amines. So, so these tertiary amine tricyclic antidepressants, uh, some of the medications which are used uh, are in the list here. Uh, imipramine, of course, is the first one uh, which was discovered uh, roundabout at the same time as uh, ipronyazid. Uh, doxepin, uh, trimipramine, clomipramine, amitriptyline, protriptyline, and amoxapine is not a, a considered a tricyclic agent. Uh, it is a tetracyclic agent. But the reason I wanted to mention and brought it here, uh, not only because it has almost the same mechanism of action, but it is a very interesting story because uh, if you had a question in your exam that uh, uh, would you, uh, can you use one molecule to treat psychosis as well as depression? The answer would be yes. Uh, very few people know that loxapin, which is a, uh, uh, which is an old uh, kind of sort of atypical antipsychotic, um, uh, you know, um, actually is metabolized by, uh, into amoxapine. So if you give loxapine to a schizophrenia patient, you can also treat some of the uh, 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 depressive symptoms. So that's a very interesting point. So amoxapine not used, uh, uh, you know, I've never used it actually to tell you frankly, but that is something which is very interesting to know. Uh, so uh, these uh, uh, tertiary amine tricyclic antidepressants, um, uh, you know, were also very effective antidepressant uh, uh, medications. 
um, uh, there is uh, there is a uh, tons of uh, of data to show their efficacy. Uh, so there was no problem in terms of efficacy. I think it was the tolerability or the adverse effects which actually uh, were the major uh, nuisance factor with these medications. Uh, they not only block the serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake pump, but they also have multiple other not so desirable molecular targets, which actually mediate their, their, uh, uh, their side effects or adverse effects. And, and you would know uh, uh, most of them, uh, the first one, uh, which, which actually causes huge problems, especially in elderly, uh, older adults, uh, uh, is the anti-muscarinic or the anticholinergic effect of these medication, which is actually quite potent. Um, you know, one of these medications, which I'm showing in the list, doxepin, is such a potent anticholinergic and antihistaminic anti uh, agent uh, that it, it, is, uh, it is available in topical uh, uh, applications. Uh, so it can uh, prevent from skin reactions and allergic reactions. Um, so, these, so these medications, because of the anticholinergic effect, uh, cause dryness of mouth, blurring of vision, uh, constipation, tachycardia, loss of sweating, which is extremely dangerous in schizophrenia patients because they can easily go out in the hot weather like Las Vegas uh, or, or Phoenix, uh, and they can develop heat stroke because their coping mechanism with the heat, which is sweating, is compromised, right? So that is the problem. Um, Anticholinergic effects also uh, cause, uh, you know, confusion. Cognitive deficits are uh, are exacerbated by these medications, uh, and we know that uh, 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 that cognitive deficits are available uh, are actually seen in uh, not only just schizophrenia, uh, but all major psychiatric disorders, including depression. So you don't want to do that. Um, and then uh, it can worsen the close angle glaucoma because of the pupillary constriction. Uh, and, and, you know, so these are a lot of uh, adverse effects which are not desirable. Um, uh, that is why these drugs uh, never got so, so popular. And the second is the antihistaminic effect, which is the blockade of the H1 receptors, histamine 1 type 1 receptor. And that, ca that causes sedation and that causes weight gain. Um, and so, so you add anticholinergic and antihistaminic effect, and you can see the disaster for uh, already confused older adults, especially. It can be a problem with, with anyone, but, but especially the older ones. And then that is not uh, the whole picture. They, these, these medications also are very potent inhibitor of adrenergic type 1 receptor, alpha 1 receptors. And the alpha-1 receptors are used usually in the treatment of uh, hypertension because they cause peripheral vasodilatation. Uh, but in this case, if somebody does not have hypertension, uh, they are going to cause uh, peripheral pooling of the blood, which will result in postural hypotension, and that will cause dizziness, which if you add to the uh, older adult population, along with the anticholinergic and antihistaminic effect, is, is, is a disaster. Uh, they can fall down, they're confused, they're dizzy, and they're, they, are, uh, uh, they, are, um, they are also sleepy. And so they can easily fall down and break their hip uh, joint. Uh, uh, you know, they, they may have a hip fracture, which is probably the end of the story for in, in terms of their, their life, right? So yeah, so those are the reasons why. Uh, but there is another one. Uh, which I, uh, which is the, actually that can be lethal, and is thus uh, is the most serious uh, uh, effect of these these medications. Uh, I'm sure you have heard about those. Uh, it's ca it causes uh, QTC uh, uh, prolongation, and QTC prolongation actually is uh, can result in torsades, depons, and and can cause sudden cardiac death. And there have been uh, hundreds and thousands of cases. Uh, reported cases. Uh, we are not talking about those which went unnoticed, and uh, there are many more which actually went unnoticed. Uh, the patient died from sudden cardiac death, uh, especially the older patient, and uh, people thought maybe it was a natural uh, uh, death or, 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 or cardiac uh, uh, you know, arrest and things like that. So anyway, uh, these tertiary amine tricyclic antidepressants, uh, despite being another robust class 
of antidepressant never became popular. And that actually uh, is very interesting to note that it took about uh, 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 two to three decades uh, to develop uh, SSRIs, as I was just shorting, showing you in the previous slide. Uh, but I think the, the, the effort of the researchers, and it's kind of a story to tell, that the researchers started looking at selectivity of antidepressants because they learned really bad lessons from uh, uh, tricyclics uh, and also to some extent for monoamine, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And they wanted to develop more selective molecules uh, without the plethora of side effects which are observed with these older uh, classes. So they actually were successful in coming out with fluoxetine. I think it was 1988. Uh, and, and, and there was so much excitement uh, at that time uh, with fluoxetine uh, that uh, everything will be rosy from now onwards. Uh, we won't have the, uh, the nuisance side effects which patients used to experience from uh, tricyclics and monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And, and, and it, 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 was, it was thought as one of the biggest breakthroughs. It, it may be. But, but I'll tell you the stories that as we began, began to know more about this class of antidepressant, uh, they are not so innocent as we used to think. Uh, and we'll go through that, uh, the point I'm trying to make. So I'm not going to go through details of this because we are going to cover SSRIs most extensively. Uh, but just to tell you that uh, SS, the uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors uh, are not that selective. They are to certain extent, they are selective, but beyond that, they can cause problems. And even before that, they can cause problems as we will begin to, to learn. Um, the, the only point I would make here about SSRIs is that one of the reasons why SSRIs became the first line of treatment is their safety. Uh, because, uh, you know, um, uh, correct me, you know, if somebody knows differently, but I think so far the literature I've reviewed, there's not a single case of mortality from SSRI's monotherapy. Remember, monotherapy is the keyword because drug interactions can kill uh, patients. Uh, so monotherapy, so, uh, you know, I sometimes make a joke uh, with my residents that, uh, that uh, do you know the only way SSRI uh, and SSRI can, can kill a patient, uh, they say, we don't know, Dr. Shad. So, so I tell them, well, if a patient takes the bottle with the pills, that, that is the only way uh, they can die from uh, an SSRI. Uh, so that is why they, you know, psychiatrists can sleep at night in peace because they know that even overdose, thousands of milligrams uh, uh, are only going to cause morbidity but not mortality. Let's go to the next class. Uh, so, so the quest for selectivity actually continued, but in this case, the researchers wanted to see that uh, we have a selective agent for serotonergic activity. Why don't we combine uh, an agent with both serotonergic activity and noradrenergic activity to see uh, if we can bring back the efficacy of tricyclics. Because remember, tricyclics, tertiary I mean, tricyclics were working on both those symptoms, right? So that is why, you know, this class of medication, combining the reuptake pump blockade of serotonin as well as norepinephrine can be called selective norepinephrine and serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Unlike the tertiary I mean, tricyclics, which were non-selective, right? So, so, uh, so they are called, they are uh, abbreviated as SNRI, as everybody knows, because these are these medic, this group of uh, this class of uh, antidepressant is also quite extensively used in the treatment of depression. And uh, you see, there are four uh, FDA approved SNRIs: vinlafaxine, disvinlafaxine, uh, duloxetine, and the latest one, which was just approved. Uh, 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 maybe a few months, uh, maybe the time is flying, maybe uh, one or two years back, is levo milnesiparan, which uh, uh, we are going to discuss a little bit more in detail, the SNRI class. So just a few common points about, about this class uh, is that uh, SNRIs, 
uh, because they uh, affect uh, two neurotransmitter systems. So there is some data to suggest that they may be slightly better than the SSRIs in terms of efficacy. Uh, but there are some studies which actually have not shown that. So it's still not confirmed, but, but theoretically speaking, it would make sense that uh, if a medication is involving two mechanisms rather than one, it might be uh, it might give a little bit more uh, efficacy. Um, but then the issue becomes that um, uh, that these medications actually have a lot of variability in terms of the ratio between serotonergic activity and the norepinephrine activity, and we are going to address that because that means uh, uh, significantly in terms of uh, their clinical use and, and how can that affect uh, uh, the, the patients. Uh, one of the uh, major uh, uh, adverse effect, which is seen much more frequently with this class is the increase in uh, blood pressure. And so uh, most patients who are on these medications uh, need to be monitored for blood pressure because of the norepinephrine effects. Um, so now uh, we move to the next class, which is known as the serotonin antagonist and reuptake inhibitors. And the abbreviation for this one is SARIs, S-A-R-I. This is not the, the SARIs, which uh, the ladies wear, but, but that is a good association by which you can remember this. So it is serotonin antagonist and reuptake inhibitors. And the two representative from this uh, class of antidepressants include nefazidone and trazodone. And um, basically, this is a class which actually gives you how we have developed uh, the molecular targets approach uh, in improving uh, the effects of uh, antidepressants, uh, especially in terms of uh, tolerability. Uh, So if you remember from my lectures on uh, uh, the uh, serotonin neurotransmitter system, and if you remember the subtypes of receptors, it will be much easier to understand this point. I just very briefly repeat that. Uh, so, um, so we know that uh, there are some subtypes of serotonin receptors which actually mediate their efficacy and there are sub, some, type, sub, some types which actually mediate their adverse effects, at least on short-term basis. Uh, the, the, the receptors, which uh, is the most important one in terms of mediating the antidepressant efficacy, uh, if you remember, is the 5-HT1A receptor. Uh, but the ones which actually mediate some of the initial side effects with SSRIs uh, are the 5-HT2A receptors, 5-HT2C receptors and 5-HT3 receptors. So how nice would it be that if you block some of those receptors, but still have the ability in a molecule to block the reuptake pump so that you are an SSRI, modified SSRI, right? You can call it that. So that's what the idea behind this class of antidepressant is, that you block 5-HT2A receptor uh, uh, before you block the reuptake pump for the serotonin. So the most beautiful things which come, thing which come out from this is that you reduce the side effects mediated by the initial stimulation of 5-HT2A receptor by SSRIs, uh, which is namely uh, uh, anxiety, sexual dysfunction, some of the cognitive uh, blurring uh, which you see with SSRIs, um, and... Uh, so I think that gives a lot of uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, advantage uh, over SSRIs when you initially from the very beginning uh, block uh, the receptor mediating some of the adverse effects of SSRIs. And usually, uh, and, and, that, and, and that, that idea is, is really unique that you block the receptors and you let the fun, uh, block the receptors which actually are mediating the bad effects and you let the receptors stimulated which are important, right? So SARIs is, is a class of uh, uh, antidepressant, which actually I really, really like for the same reasons, uh, because, uh, you know, one point I would like to make here, which is important in terms of mechanism-based mechanism learning is that, uh, you know, 
uh, I don't know uh, how many of you uh, have treated uh, uh, depressed patients, uh, but there may be some residents out there uh, uh, who, who definitely have that experience. Uh, my experience has been that uh, the patients uh, can be broadly classified into two different clinical types uh, in terms of SSRI's uh, response and tolerability. Uh, one uh, uh, class is where SSRIs uh, uh, have relatively less side effects, which are tolerable, and they go away with time, uh, and they respond nicely to SSRIs. Uh, so that is one group, which uh, fortunately is probably the majority of the group uh, in which SSRIs are used. But there is, there is uh, um, a relatively large, large number of patients uh, anywhere between uh, 40 to 45, even maybe 50, half the population. Um, uh, uh, I think it may be less than that uh, because this is all anecdotal based on my, my experience. The studies uh, have some uh, given some ideas, but nothing is definitive. And that the second group actually is the one which you, as soon as you start SSRIs, they actually develop very severe side effects. Uh, and these side effects don't go away and the patient stops taking the medication. And the efficacy is also uh, very compromised. This is a group which, uh, which I believe uh, needs a different mechanism of action, such as SARIs. Because if they are having a lot of anxiety problems with SSRIs, uh, you might think about something which actually blocks that effect of SSRIs, but it still gives you serotonergic boost on the receptors you want to stimulate. So, um, uh, so basically, and if you, you know, if you have questions about these, uh, we can have uh, maybe an interactive session later on, uh, which you can uh, uh, ask me questions. And I wish this could have been interactive session, but unfortunately we cannot. Uh, I love to have an interactive audience so we can, uh, it actually increases the, um, the benefits of the presentation. Anyway, so nefazodone and trazodone are those drugs which despite the fact are extremely difficult to use. Let me clarify. Uh, trazodones and nefazodones and these, these medication actually have a very huge inter-individual variability in plasma level. So it is clinically difficult to find appropriate dose for any one of these medications. Uh, nefazodone uh, uh, had some cases of severe hepatitis and it was uh, uh, the, the pharmaceutical company stopped making uh, nefazodone uh, commercially, but I think the generic is still available. But trazodone, there are no problems. As a matter of fact, trazodone is, uh, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, is the commonest uh, uh, sedative agent which is used along with SSRIs. Uh, and not as a monotherapy for uh, depression, uh, which, which uh, I, I, I don't support uh, because of the reasons I just explained to you. And uh, one thing I would like to mention here is that trazodone uh, uh, sustained release have been developed. And uh, actually uh, that has made the job of finding the right dose for the right patient has made, has been, has simplified. Uh, and the, and the seesaw, uh, effect of uh, plasma levels variability with a short life acting uh, with a short half life drug such as trazodone uh, is addressed by a sustained release or extended release and that that has actually made the use of this uh, medication uh, uh, much easier so there are things which you can do to still use this uh, stephen stahl actually has talked about this medication in his book uh, in some details and he actually talks about how uh, trazodone can be uh, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor at uh, uh, conventional dosages. You go slightly higher, you can block a norepinephrine reuptake, reuptake pump, and even at higher dosages, it can block dopamine. So those are, uh, uh, of course, not uh, uh, confirmed, but, but some of the studies have suggested that. So uh, all in all, I, I love this class of medication because that gives you an option when, uh, when patients are intolerant and uh, non-responders to SSRIs. Uh, and, 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 you know, this is a, a, a really a good class of antidepressant you can move to. Um, see how long it takes to explain these. 
and we have not even uh, gone to the details of each class, which probably we won't be able to do. So, um, so the next class of antidepressant is called the selective norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitor. Um, so again, going back to the story, which I'm trying trying to develop to make you understand better, is that you know we we had experimented with the selective serotonergic medications. We experimented with the selective serotonergic plus noradrenergic medications. We experimented with the selective blockers along with the SSRI-like effect, such as trazodone. Uh, we thought we have not actually looked at dopamine uh, systems after the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And so uh, uh, it brought up this, this idea of having a molecule which has effect on dopamine reuptake inhibition. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so it happened that norepinephrine effect uh, was a part of that molecule. And we know that as bupropion, uh, the generic name is Welbutrin. It is also available uh, as, uh, as a, uh, a cigarette uh, smoking cessation uh, drug. Uh, and and um, uh, it, it is used as such, although it is not as effective as some of the other strategies. Um, so one of the most important point I would like to make about bupropion is that bupropion, um, uh, you, say, you remember you asked me about the under doses, dose, dosages, uh, um, under dosing of antidepressants. Bupropion is one of the classic example, as I talked about in the last lecture, uh, that it is underdosed because, uh, because of the fear of uh, seizures uh, in the clinicians. Uh, but the people who know the molecule uh, know that uh, even for 50 milligram, which is the which is the uh, the the highest dose recommended by the FDA or approved by the FDA to treat uh, depression, actually may not be effective as a monotherapy uh, at least in a large number of patients. And that is why in clinical practice you will see that bupropion is generally not seen as a monotherapy for the treatment of depression. The role for bupropion comes. Uh, when you are having sexual dysfunctions with SSRIs uh, and you want to give boost through not epi and dopamine systems to address those, uh, those uh, side effects from SSRIs. Uh, also, the bupropion effect on cognition uh, might be quite positive because of the dopamine effect um, and also effect on uh, some of the uh, other, such as uh, 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 you know the, uh, the 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 energy levels because dopamine can can have a positive effect on those uh, and motivation and of course uh, with the dopamine effects. But there is a you know I I think it is I may not get a chance to address this. I really need to address this uh, at this time. Um, bupropion is misunderstood uh, uh, in terms of its mechanism of action. And the misunderstanding is that it is primarily a dopamine reuptake inhibitor, which is completely wrong. Because uh, dopamine, uh, I'm sorry, bupropion, uh, based actually on very, very well-known researchers, they think that bupropion has very, very, very limited activity in blocking dopamine reuptake pump. So a lot of people are surprised when I tell them this. Uh, uh, primarily, bupropion is a norepinephrine reuptake pump blocker rather than a dopamine reuptake pump blocker. But then, uh, you know, I'm sure you are just dying to ask me questions now, but, but a lot of people uh, uh, ask me that Dr. Shah, if it does not block the dopamine uh, reuptake pump and it does not uh, increase the dopamine activity, how come uh, it is used for cigarette cessation and how come it addresses some of the side effects which are relieved by the dopaminergic uh, neurotransmission, uh, which I was just mentioning in terms of SSRIs. So how can you say that it is not uh, dopaminergic? Well, there is a very easy answer to that. Um, and it, it is, uh, 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 the answer is that the higher cortical centers, uh, they most, uh, regions in the higher cortical centers, the uh, prefrontal subregions, uh, actually uh, have very, very small number of dopamine reuptake pump. Uh, and most of the reuptake uh, uh, of dopamine is conducted by the norepinephrine reuptake, reuptake pump in the prefrontal and the higher cortical centers. So 
this is very important. Uh, you, have, you know, I, I, I hope you can remember this. Um, that is the reason why when you give norepinephrine reuptake pump blockers, you actually not only increase norepinephrine activity in the higher cortical centers, but also the dopamine activity, which is the reason why bupropion may be effective in some cases of uh, even ADHD. You know, uh, and it, it is worth thinking. And that's where, you know, this mechanism, mechanism based understanding comes from. As I promised to you, I'll bring up the examples is that if there is a patient who has some problem with attention and concentration, and maybe are not a full blown ADHD, and they're depressed, uh, you might think about bupropion because you are killing two birds with one stone. So, so this, these are the things which, 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 can, uh, which can improve your clinical practice and skills. Um, one of the, uh, one, uh, another important point I want to uh, make about uh, the, the prefer prefrontal cortical effects of uh, bupropion on dopamine and the lack of dopaminergic uh, uh, enhancement in the lower cortical centers uh, uh, pri uh, primarily the limbic circuit and the nucleus accumbens uh, is is most beautiful uh, uh, part of this uh, you know knowledge is that when bupropion is given it does not cause any change in dopamine activity in the lower cortical centers so it never causes psychosis so so uh, you know if if people don't understand the mechanism they probably won't understand this point there is not a single case of bupropion causing psychosis. Why? Because the only increase in dopamine activity is in the higher cortical centers, okay? Uh, the next uh, uh, group uh, is very fascinating. Now we are getting into much more complex areas uh, of antidepressant mechanisms. Uh, it is called noradrenergic and specific serotonergic antidepressant, uh, which is uh, abbreviated as NASA. Um, you, can, uh, you can remember that by associating uh, uh, this class to NASA because it's extremely innovative and NASA is innovative too, right? So you can remember that and it is noradrenergic and a specific serotonergic antidepressant. And the example here is mirtazapine. And mirtazapine is a drug which you can call as maybe, you know, the first antidepressant ever to have a multimodal effect because it, it works on, um, multiple molecular targets. Uh, uh, and uh, I would actually like to discuss this in further details uh, in later lectures, but only one point to make is that um, it is uh, a unique drug. Uh, it is the first of the antidepressants which actually block a alpha adrenergic receptor. Uh, uh, and, and that receptor is uh, called alpha two uh, 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 adrenergic receptor. The alpha-2 receptors are, are very interesting because they are autoreceptors. And the autoreceptors provide a negative feedback loop so that if there is excessive activity of a neurotransmitter system, it can actually, the presynaptic neuron, put a break on the release of that neurotransmitter to prevent from any neurotoxicity, right? So alpha-2 receptors are sitting on the presynaptic neurons. If you remember my first uh, few lectures, uh, you will understand this. So uh, when a drug blocks alpha-2 uh, adrenergic receptors, uh, thus removing the negative feedback loop, uh, it will result in increased release of norepinephrine, which is how the drug works as an antidepressant uh, because it increases the uh, noradrenergic neurotransmission. Um, but that is not the end of the story. At the same time, when there are autoreceptors working on uh, uh, blockade of the autoreceptors, working on increasing the norepinephrine neurotransmission. At the same time, there are some heteroreceptors. Uh, the heteroreceptors um, uh, are those receptors which are sitting on the serotonergic cell bodies. And so the alpha-2 receptor sitting on a serotonergic neuron, which also increase serotonin neurotransmission. Because again, these are presynaptic Auto receptors. So when a heteroreceptor sitting on a different neurotransmitter cell body, neuronal cell body, it will have the same effect of removing the breaks from that system, which in this case is serotonin. So that is why mirtazapine not only increases 
norepinephrine neurotransmission, but also increases serotonin neurotransmission. But that is not the end of the story. Then mirtazapine goes to the subtypes of the serotonin receptors and blocks some of them. Remember, we were talking about nephazodones and trazodones communicating some of the beneficial effects of these medications. This is also a unique medication and it goes beyond uh, nephazodones and trazodones, the saris. How it goes beyond? It not only blocks the 5ST2A, it also blocks 5ST2C and it also blocks 5ST3 receptors. So what are the good effects of those? By blocking 5ST2A, you already know, I discussed that, right? By blocking 5ST2C, anxiety and sleep improves such as it improves with trazodone, with 5ST2A. So there are a lot of similarities between the two receptors. But the one unique feature of 5ST2C blockade is the weight gain. You may know that the antipsychotic medications, the higher, uh, the higher the blockade of 5ST2C receptor they have, the more the weight gain uh, you know, the, uh, the, the patient's uh, uh, experience. And that is the same thing. So this drug is, is, <clears throat> has beneficial effects, uh, just like trazodone, but on top of that, it causes weight gain. Uh, and uh, by blockade of the 5-HT3, it blocks the GI upset of the SSRI because 5-HT3 receptors are lining the gut. And if you block them, uh, the GI upset, such as nausea, uh, uh, nausea diarrhea, and vomiting are, not, uh, are prevented. So, so now you have the profile of this unique drug, which has multifaceted mechanism of action. Now you think about this and you find out which population could it benefit the most? Old patients, because there's another thing which I didn't tell you. It also has antihistaminic effects, which makes it a little bit uh, helping in sedation, right? So now an old patient is not sleeping well, not eating well, they are cachectic and they are medically frail, physically frail. Which medication you want to use in nursing homes? Metazepine. So again, mechanism-based understanding gives you idea for the best application of uh, an antidepressant. So again and again, I'll repeat those. Uh, Yushik, you want to stop here or you want me to continue? Uh, uh, Dr. Shad, I would like, there are a few questions and we can okay. take the today's questions okay. and uh, okay. we, we, we can have two, three, four lectures on this. I mean, um, no, yeah, whatever we time we want, yeah, we yeah. whatever time we want to utilize, it's our time. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Because uh, so many interesting points, especially the stories. I love them. <laughs> yeah, story makes it very interesting. Very, and, very and interesting and it, memorable. Helpful for you to remember, right? Yes, absolutely. So the first question is that um, uh, in a male diabetic patient suffering from erectile dysfunction and new onset depression, what would be the more suitable choice of antidepressant? Considering one of the stresses it, in patients. Is... Can you repeat? Can you repeat that? Yeah. In a male yeah. diabetic patient, oh, suffering, diabetic. yeah, diabetic patient suffering from erectile dysfunction and uh -huh. new onset depression, what would be the more suitable choice of antidepressant? Um, considering yeah. one of the stressor in patient is ongoing decreased libido and erectile dysfunction. Th that is a beautiful question. Thank, thank yes. you for asking. And yeah. not an easy answer. Uh, because okay. now we are going to go back to the mechanisms and try to understand uh, why, what is the rationale for picking one over the other, right? Hmm. Um, so in terms of, let's talk about diabetes first. Uh, very few people know this, and I'll discuss this in my SSRI presentation, that SSRIs can cause weight gain. Um, peroxetine is the worst, uh, which can actually cause uh, weight gain, which is uh, defined as 7% or more than 7% increase in body weight. And about 25% of the patients on paroxetine can cross that limit, okay? The situation is not that bad with other SSRIs. Uh, so fortunately, fluoxetine, citalopram, uh, and you can include S-citalopram in that too, and, uh, 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 and uh, sertraline, 
uh, they cause only about 4% uh, across that, that threshold. So first thing to remember, not use peroxidine, okay? Right. Um, yeah. The second point is that, uh, but, but even before I go back, because I don't want to say, somebody say, oh, Dr. Shad lied to us, because, uh, because the initial effect of SSRIs are actually weight loss, especially with fluoxetine. This, because fluoxetine goes initially and it stimulates 5-HT2C receptors, and that causes decrease in appetite. But over the long run, when 5-HT2C receptors upregulate, it results in long-term weight gain. So mm. yeah, I wanted to clarify that point, okay? Mm -hmm. Especially with fluoxetine. As a matter of fact, Lily was very excited initially. They mm -hmm. wanted to get further trials of decreasing obesity with fluoxetine, but when they saw the long-term effects, they stopped their idea, right? Uh, anyway, so, so, so there. Now let's talk about the sexual dysfunction. And uh, I think these questions are, are very practical question, and I'm going to address these during uh, SSRI presentation because, because I just want to go to details because these are practical questions you have to face every day in the clinic. Now, in terms of sexual dysfunction, um, uh, you know, um, in terms of the effect of the diabetes, of course, the foremost thing is the effective control of diabetes, right? There, you, of right. course, know that. But when we are talking about the psychotropic, you are asking me indirectly, which medications are actually better in, in terms of uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the frequency and magnitude of, and the problems with sexual dysfunction, right? So, so let me talk about that. Among SSRIs, I'll just give you the bottom line. Fluoxamine is the best. It causes the least sexual dysfunction. Uh, it is not that frequently used, but a lot of people uh, miss on it. Uh, you know why? Again, another point which I often make in my presentation, you know, when you completely rely on evidence-based practice, sometimes you miss the boat. Mm -hmm. So fluoxamine is not approved for the treatment of depression by the FDA, only yeah. for OCD. OCD, yeah. So if you, if you listen yeah. to an expert who believes in evidence-based medicine, you are going to miss the boat on fluoxamine. We, we never use we never use fluoxamine. Yeah, absolutely. That is the fluoxetine. Yeah, just give fluoxetine. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So fluoxamine is 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 uh, has uh, based on some of the studies I know of. Fluoxamine has the uh, has the least effect on and and uh, sexual function. Uh, the problem is that it is involved in a lot of drug interactions, so you have to be really careful mm -hmm. because it inhibits multiple. Uh, uh, enzymes. Um, so, so villafaxin, I'm sorry, uh, uh, flu, uh, fluoxamine, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about evidence-based, uh, if we don't know that uh, fluoxamine is another SSRI, uh, and because of the flawed study design, it mm. did not separate from the placebo, and FDA uh, did not approve it because mm. of that, it does not mean that fluoxamine does not work in depression. Mm -hmm. I, I simply don't buy that argument, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that about SSRIs. Uh, Escetalopram might be slightly better than some of the others because it is the least potent and can cause less problem in activating the, 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 uh, the downward going uh, 5-HT2A uh, steroidergic tracts in the spinal cord. Uh, which mediates a sexual dysfunction. Anyway, so so those are some of the things. But again, you know, I want to talk about some of the other classes which might be really beautiful uh, or are much better than SSRIs in causing uh, in patients who have sexual dysfunction. Uh, we were just talked about bupropion, right? Yeah, bupropion. Yeah, yeah, yeah bupropion. We talked yeah. about, and yeah. it can also treat the comorbid sexual uh, of the the yeah. SSRI yeah. induced sexual dysfunction mm -hmm. also, mm -hmm. right? Because it is stimulating, right? And then uh, talking about some of the SNRIs may be less problematic. Why? Because they not only increase serotonergic, but noradrenergic as well, which right, might okay. neutralize or counterbalance some of the SSRI or the serotonergic mediated sexual dysfunction. And then mirtazapine can be stimulating, uh, although mm. it causes a lot of weight gain. So I don't know how good that and would sedation, be. And sedation, and sedation also. Sedation is a problem with mirtazapine. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Mm. So mm. I would I would not recommend mirtazapine, but mm. remember, it is alpha-2 agonist. 
Mm. I'm sorry, antagonist, increasing norepinephrine outflow, right? Mm -hmm. So that that is good for uh, for sexual function. Mm. Um, and and we we have other classes we'll discuss later. But so far, I wanted to give you this answer. So, Dr. Ali Ewan, did you get your answer? I think he. Yes, he, yes, I got yeah. my answer pretty well. Yeah, I, and, I said. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I said bupropion. Ali Ali Ewan did not uh, uh, accept it when I said. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't accept it. So I said. I just wanted to okay, share opinion on that. You no, know, obviously, yeah. obviously, obviously, I also you made me you know doubtful also. I said okay. So Dr. Fazia Chima has asked uh, uh, that is bupropion and eripiprazole similar in some way in their in terms of dopamine. No, not at all. Uh, not at uh, so all. let yeah. me let Thanks me let God, me give you. I, I answered the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me answer on the mechanism of action base basis. Yes. Uh, bupropion, I already told you, it is primarily a norepinephrine reuptake pump blocker, not a dopamine reuptake pump blocker. Maybe some little bit. Uh, so that is not what uh, eripiprazole is. Eripiprazole is unique and that's a unique, unique which, and yeah, which actually is a partial agonist at dopamine yeah. type 2 receptor. Yeah. So there's no similarity between the two. So if I am I am not wrong, I mean eripiprazole is the only one which affects on the negative as well as positive because of this, because it has it works on uh, all levels of dopamine receptors and it is used in schizophrenia for mood dysregulation. Yeah, so so for yeah, we need to be careful. In making, you know, in one thing I've learned in research is we never make such a, a kind of a strong statement about a medication, right? So mm -hmm. let me let me rephrase what you just said. So eripiprazole being a partial agonist has mm -hmm. less chances of at least causing negative symptoms, if not improving them. So okay. you are right in okay. that. Okay, 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 yeah. okay, and, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. And, mm -hmm. and so, so, you know, basically we need to, we need to be, uh, uh, when we do presentations, we we use very mm. diplomatic language because mm. Uh, mm. because a lot of people have uh, knowledge which uh, which actually contradicts yours. Uh, so mm. you leave a room to come back mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. try to explain, right? Mm -hmm. So eripiprazole actually is in good in many many ways. And remember, mm -hmm. Fazia, uh, eripiprazole is not just a partial agonist for dopamine type two receptor. But it is also a partial agonist for 5-HT1A, yes, which means yes. it stabilizes two major neurotransmitter systems in the brain. Mm -hmm. That is why it can be actually effective for so many variety of psychiatric mm -hmm. medication uh, mm -hmm. disorders. Disorder. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and that is not the end. It is also a 5-HT2A blocker like the other atypical antipsychotic medications. So I don't want to spend a lot of time, but we can discuss more in detail. More on detail. Okay, yeah. Dr. Zabi has asked, why is mirtizapine sedating at lower level and not at higher level, higher doses? That is a beautiful question. Because mm. of the time, I did not address that. A very mm. simple answer. Uh, so the <clears throat> affinity for uh, blocking of the H1 or the histamine type 1 receptor is higher than blocking the alpha-2 receptors, okay? What does that mean? It okay. means that you are going to get sedating effect before you get the stimulating effect, at least at the lower dosages. But when you cross a certain threshold and you, and you go and you go get more alpha-2 antagonist mediated stimulation in the norepinephrine system, your antihistaminic effects will be compromised by that. So that is why the lower dosages are more sedating than the higher and dosages. And the higher doses are not yeah. sedating. Okay. Yeah. The next they're activating. Is, yeah, they're activating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the next is how is 5-HT2C blockage causing weight gain? Yeah. A long story. Oh a, a lecture can be given. <laughs> yeah, my God. These are good questions. You know, good it question. seems like you See? guys, you guys yeah. are already residents because you yeah, residents the, don't ask those questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, a very simple answer, uh, uh, and this is based on research, uh, you know, and, and I, can, I can send you some papers on that. So 5-HT2C receptor is, is a very, very interesting receptor because it lies in the ventromedial nucleus of the hypothalamus. And in the ventronuclear, uh, vent ventromedial uh, nucleus of hypothalamus is known as a satiety center, okay? 
so when so when five ht two C receptors get activated, you feel satiety, and you stop eating, right? But when you block these receptors, you will never feel uh, satiated, and and you are going to continue to eat. That is a very basic explanation of five ht two C block co blockade causing weight gain. And so the major difference between uh, antihistaminic weight gain and the 5-HT2C mediated uh, weight gain, uh, blockade mediated weight gain, is that the antihistaminic weight gain is relatively short term. You get used to that. But the 5-HT2C blockade uh, mediated weight gain is, is long term and it continues mm -hmm. even after years. So you have to be very careful. And that is why alanzapine and clozapine which are the two atypical antipsychotic medications cause huge weight gain over years and it continues. And that is mediated most probably by the 5-HT2C receptors. So again, another evidence I would present to you is there have been some <clears throat> genetic polymorphisms of 5-HT2C receptors. And there is a specific uh, 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 SNP uh, polymorphism uh, SNP polymorphism, which actually has uh, been uh, seen as causing much more weight gain than the than the other one, and that SNP actually mediates in decreased activity of 5-HT2C, which means the same as antagonism, right? It all makes sense, right? And then there is an animal study in which they actually had a 5-HT2C knockout mice uh, as compared. To the mice who still had intact 5-HT2C gene, okay? And I wish I could show you the picture. The one is like, looks like an elephant, the one with the deleted gene, five, uh, knockout uh, gene 5-HT2C, as compared to the one who had, they, they look like, they don't even look like the same animal. So there is plenty of evidence of involvement of 5-HT2C receptor in weight regulation. So we need a molecule um, with slight activation of 5-HT2C for our uh, weight, who are weight conscious. <laughs> yeah, so 5-HT2C, but there is a price, Fazia. There is always a price. Okay. Remember in the previous lectures, I always used to tell you, doesn't matter which receptor, which neurotransmitter you're working on, uh, you think it might work and uh, result in beneficial action, uh, beneficial action, there's always a price to pay. Mm -hmm. And the price to pay here is that 5-HT2C stimulation can cause extreme anxiety, even panic attacks. So, so that is the price you have to give, at least in short-term basis, okay? okay. Uh, but, but, but you are making a point. There is a medication which is called lorcaserin. Lorcaserin, mm -hmm. yeah, there is a medication, right? <clears throat> it is not used for uh, obesity, but it is a a mild uh, activator of 5-HT2C receptor. Okay. So there have been some talks about using that to control uh, the control weight. weight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But since you're talking about this, there are some very exciting studies going on uh, with the uh, alanzapine uh, mm -hmm. combined with the, uh, with the, a drug which is called uh, semidorphan. Semidorphan is, a, uh, is an antagonist of the opioid system. And they have found really good results that, that by adding semidorphin to alanzapine, the weight gain is several folds lower. And the mechanism behind it is the opioid because food is an addiction, right? And mm -hmm. if you block that system, you are going to probably result in good effects. So we can talk about this uh, more, okay, but okay. are there any so, questions? Uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, Sadia Usmani has asked, which class of antidepressant is Trintilix. So that is vertiox, vertiox. Yeah, yeah, vertioxetine. Yeah. Vertioxetine. So if you look at my next slide, okay. I was I have not done with the mechanisms. There are much more coming. Okay. Exciting okay. ones actually. Yes. So oh, okay. so you see that multimodal antidepressant eleven number eleven vertioxetine that is the trintilix, and and I'm not going to. Uh, give you the bottom line right now because it is such an exciting molecule. It is multimodal and there is a synergy, there is an orchestra of hitting uh, the various types of serotonergic receptors 
Mm. Even three within 5-HT1 receptor. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, a, you know, uh, 5-HT1A, 5-HT1B, 5-HT1D, you know. So this, you know, and differential effect. One for, it is it is partial agonist for one versus agonist for the other one versus uh, antagonist for 5-HT1D. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll talk about this more in detail, but that's mm -hmm. a good question because Trintalix or vertioxetine is one of the most unique antidepressant in terms of cognitive effects. We I think we did discuss that a little bit. Okay, so just one more question. What is your drug of choice for depression secondary to chronic alcohol and or stimulant use for chronic alcohol, uh, if comorbid co uh, chronic alcohol? Yeah. So what yeah, do so, you... Uh, yeah, so, uh, so that is, uh, uh, you know, it, it, not a short answer again, but but I think I think the bottom line would be you are go you going to use an antidepressant which actually actually addresses the reward system. And again, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it comes to bupropion, although you may be very, very cautious about using bupropion in alcoholic patients. Why? Because bupropion lowers the seizure threshold and alcoholic patients have electrolyte imbalance because of dehydration. And that can be a huge problem in that population. But at the same time, uh, you know, you can think about, uh, 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 so out of the box thinking, right? That's what mm -hmm. psychopharm is. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not completely evidence-based. It is out of box thinking, right? So the out of box thinking is, why not you think about eripiprizol? Uh, mm -hmm. Because eripiprizol is a, a, not as a monotherapy, but at least a very effective augmentation agent for treating depression. Uh, as well, it is has the lowest risk in uh, in terms of uh, alcohol use in, uh, in in depressed patients. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, let's play it safe. You know, bupropion mm -hmm. is not the choice. I just wanted to give you an idea about that. Mm -hmm. Eripiprazole is used more frequently. Yeah. Yeah. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Shah. Uh, Dr. Shah, can excellent. I ask one yes. question? Uh, I was waiting yeah, for yeah, Dr. Fozia. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah. Dr. Shah, I've been interested in this phenomena and I've been reading about it. And a few of the psychiatrists have been talking about it as well. And it is SSRI based emotional blunting. Like the patients come to you and they say that, yes, we are not feeling depressed, yeah. but we are not feeling anything at all. So maybe there is a component yeah. of uh, anhedonia in those. And maybe we can make it better with bupropion. If someone comes to us and say, yes, that my depressive symptoms are gone. But uh, the only symptom that I really want to talk about is that I want to feel things again. Yes, so Yushe, you are asking a, a, a excellent practical question. You you know you hear from a lot of your patients, right? Yeah, it's like emotional blunting. Yeah, yeah. Remember what I told you when I started my my presentation today? I told you SSRIs are not the perfect antidepressant drugs. They have a lot of baggage. Uh, I may have told you that SSRIs are not even a good treatment for PTSD, although they are approved by the FDA. Because PTSD patients already have emotional numbness, you know, and cognitive uh, numbness, right? So mm -hmm. it, it further enhance, enhances those problems, although it does treat some of the comorbid uh, depressive and anxiety symptoms, right? I, I agree with that. But but so in terms of the cognitive, uh, 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 you're talking about the emotional blunting, right? Emotional numbness, right? Mm -hmm. It causes both, by the way, as we discussed, right? In terms of emotional numbness, I think one of the major since we are talking about the mechanism-based understanding, let me tell you the putative mechanism which we think might be responsible for causing emotional numbness, uh, as well as actually cognitive numbness or, or blunting in patients with SSRI. Uh, remember I told you there is always a price to pay? You boost serotonergic activity to treat depression, but then you negate dopamine activity in a lot of brain areas. Mm -hmm. And that is we think is 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 the basic reason why we 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 think that the patient's reward system and their 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 uh, you know the system of pleasure and motivation is somewhat blunted. That is expressed as cognitive and emotional bluntness. And uh, Dr. Shah, like uh, not everyone complains of this, but most of the people on SSRI complains of this, uh, and a very few people on other uh, class of drugs. So. What would be the good option? Like we should actually uh, change the class of drug or maybe uh, we shouldn't 
tell them that it would go away on their own. So what should the next step if someone comes to you and say that uh, I don't feel like yeah. myself if I take these yeah. drugs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I feel I feel less depressed, but I don't feel anything. I'm becoming uh, uh, maybe more distant uh, with my family uh, than I was when I was depressed. As as uh, at least I was feeling something, right? Exactly. Yeah. So some patients may have that. You say that's a great question. Um, so you know the strategies to address that are multiple, as you know. One is uh, that. Um, so basically, when we address uh, medications issues with in, in psychopharmacology, we basically talk about augmenting augmentation strategies versus, versus switching st strategies, right? So both are valid, but in different circumstances. Uh, if there's too much emotional blunting going on, and you think you don't want to go to augmentation, you have had enough with this medication, you want to switch it to something else, then I'll give you some classes. We actually discuss those, some of those, uh, like the saris, the trazodones and the nefazodones, right? Difficult to use, but, but if you use extended release, you might have a much easier time, right? Uh, then, then think about uh, uh, mirtazapine if the patient is not diabetic or, uh, or uh, maybe needs some weight gain or something because of anorexia caused by depression. You never know, right? So that is one. And then uh, the, the vertioxetine, and we are going to discuss some of the other uh, 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 you know, subtypes, uh, classifications, uh, which might be really helpful. Uh, SNRIs actually uh, can, can be beneficial because remember, SNRIs have a differential ratio between serotonin and norepinephrine. So here you will pick a SNRI, which more norepinephrine uh, uh, than, than in other as compared to other. And, and remind me, we can discuss this issue with when we talk about those, okay? Sure thing. Thank you so much, Dr. Shah. Over yeah. to you, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Shah, uh, one more question. So yeah. uh, uh, have you seen that initially patient says that this the, the uh, emotional blunting, the zoom, zombie effect, yeah, with yeah. time, with time, it improves or it stays. If if someone is saying that he is having this, so mm. then it stays. Yeah, uh, Fazia, this is a long term effect. If I can say that, oh, okay. and it okay. may also take a little a bit of time uh, to set in. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, yeah, because initially the patient is suffering from depression so much mm -hmm. that they are not able to notice it or observe it. Mm -hmm. The self awareness mm -hmm. comes later. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that I started to feel better, but now I'm not feeling uh, my emotions are blunted. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but this is a long-term effect. You know why? Because, mm -hmm. uh, because the, um, uh, the serotonin-induced uh, compromise in dopaminergic function, function uh, okay. never goes away. Yeah. So uh, how many percentage? What is the percentage? Because this is a common side effect. I mean, as you said that, uh, most antidepressants are patients do not stop because of uh, less efficacy. They stop because of side effects. They just so many side yeah, effects. One of the side effects and this they, yeah, they, they just yeah. stop taking. Yeah. 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 So, what is the percentage? If I say one to on a scale of one to ten, or just like ten percent, twenty percent, seventy, how many well, how patients? How is the frequency? How is the frequency yeah, of yeah. the side effect? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I think it also depends upon the dosages. Uh, mm. uh, and and yeah, so if you're using higher dosages than needed by the patient, it will be a much bigger problem. So I, I right. didn't complete so the answer. Okay. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't complete my, my answer to Yushe. Another mm -hmm. strategy is to slightly decrease the dose and, and see whether without losing efficacy, yeah. you mm -hmm. can enhance the tolerability, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that is always should be on your mind. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me tell you the saddest story of psychiatric practice these days is psychiatrists never think about decreasing a medication. They switch the medication. They all, yeah. all they switch okay. or or mm. they further go up. Oh, yeah. okay. Mm. Yeah. Or they add they, something else. Yeah. Or, yeah. 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 or add something it's, else, you know. Sorry, yeah. it's just a request and maybe a mm. suggestion. I, I'm trying to make. Do you think it's possible for you if in future we can discuss glutamate hypotheses along with some serotonin yeah. subtype receptors? It'll be yeah. like, you know. Yeah, so you, 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 you know, if you see my slide, I have the ketamine there, right? So we'll, we'll discuss that. We cannot complete this presentation without ketamine, right? 
So no uh, problem. We we, we, we think that we are going to have three, four lectures on, and it's a, you know, it's a most common, I mean, used medications are antidepressants. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. The, um, okay. we, we have no, I mean, we can have four, yeah. five, because I want to know that as you started your lecture with that ECT is so good, but I want to know that what is the ECT on TMS? Do you think TMS is what? So one lecture we can have yeah, on we, both. We yeah. can have on neuromodulation one lecture, yeah. but the sky's the limit for you. <laughs> so okay, <laughs> just we can, we can. Yeah. So, I mean, I really like the, I mean, uh, when we discuss the topic and I send you, uh, I was really impressed. I mean, the um, title you sent that, uh, can mechanism-based learning optimize antidepressant? I mean, this is such a beautiful thing that you, um, but I mean, uh, in one hour, I have learned that you can use the side effect according to the side effect you give the medication. If you need, along mm. with the uh, depression, yeah. patient is mm. having lack of sleep, give something making him sedating, okay? Yeah, so the but, side effect can become a blessing. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so yeah. Mechan if you know the mechanism of action of exactly. the medication, you you exactly. you can better, yeah. You can increase the tolerability exactly. because patient comes back with side effects and yeah. you have not taken the history well. You don't yeah, know yeah. what other he is going through. So you just start with the whole. Absolutely history. right. Yeah. Yeah. And then when those side effects, they become a problem for the patient, yeah. then they, yeah. then they, uh, they lost, I mean, yeah. their interest in the medication and yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. okay so we'll, thank you very much. Uh, we'll thank you very much, Dr. Shah thank you. for your time Brave. on this Saturday. Thank you so much. Of, yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Shah. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank You're you. welcome. Okay. 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 Okay.